Okay, let's get started for today. Abba's heart, finding our way back to the Father's delight. Abba's heart, finding our way back to the Father's delight. This is a book by Neil and Matt Lozano. We have read six chapters of the book. Um, we're getting into some... Here's what I didn't want to happen. I didn't want this to be almost like for us to be approaching this like it's a task to be completed. I feel like that we've sort of gotten into enough content um, that we may need to, to some pondering and sitting with some stuff. And what I really truly believe is happening, because I've had feedback from several, is that, you know, as we're even moving forward, the Lord is still revealing things from maybe previous chapters and bringing things to light. And sometimes, you know, once we unlock that darkness and call those wounds and bondage to light, um, it's this, it's a series, it's a journey for that revelation to come. And, and it's like, it's like once you tap into that, it's going to come, you know? Um, and, and sometimes I think when there's pain involved, we have to sort of prepare ourselves, embrace ourselves for the pain. And so, you know, we're just going to pause here for a second. Not very long. It's not going to be till Monday, but maybe a day or so. And then probably from here forward, because I feel like the content, it's like we've had our little introduction. We, we've, we've been eased into it a little bit, maybe with just the first couple of chapters. We may take two days from here on out, like a day in the reading uh, and then a day maybe reflecting on some of the study guide questions, okay? That um, we'll, we'll fill it out, right? We, we don't have to maintain any rigid structure here. I don't want to move too slow because I don't want to we don't want to lose anyone who's, um, you know, tends to be very sequential and orderly. But at the same time, I want to, I don't want anyone to feel so far like behind um, because we tend to compare ourselves and, and that's a whole nother issue. Um, but anyway, I just feel like that this information is very important and I don't want it to just be a task that you have to accomplish for the day because that defeats the purpose of what the Lord wants to do right? If we feel like we're shutting off this chapter to move on to the next chapter, it's like, eh, probably not what we want to do. So, Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning with such gratitude. Thank you for the journey. Thank you for the journey. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for new life. Thank you for new life in Jesus Christ and, and coming to understand what that means for us. Holy Spirit, show us the way. Show us the way. We surrender to you. Lord, we surrender to you. Show us the way. Jesus, it is in your most powerful and holy name that we offer this prayer. Just a simple prayer. Show us the way. We surrender. Amen. All right, y'all. So here's sort of here's sort of what we're going to do today. Not sort of. This is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. It's actually found in the book in chapter five. All right. Like top of page 59. Very end of the first paragraph in chapter five. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. Let's just sit with that statement for a, for a moment before we unpack it. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. So, I think it begins first by acknowledging, okay, being set free. That's an encounter with Jesus when we experience him. But prior to that, in order to even be available for an encounter, we have to acknowledge that we need a Savior. We have to acknowledge that we can't save ourselves and that we need a Savior. That, we're, that we have brokenness, that we have woundedness, that... Um, like, saved from what? If we have got every bit of that, what we think is safeguarded, locked away, maybe hadn't hadn't really addressed it ever in our life because we come from a generation where we were told to suck it up or forget about it or you ought to be over that by now or who knows, the people who were, who 
were entrusted to your care may have been the very ones who wounded you. And so they for sure weren't going to look at their stuff if they never had an encounter and, and came to repentance in their life. You know, or maybe it was people who just didn't know how to love or any number of things. Something could have happened to us or we could have experienced something in someone else's life. And that had been a doorway for Satan to come in and wreak havoc in our own you carry anxiety, if you carry fear, if your mind is always worrying about what if, all right, we have to acknowledge that we need to be saved. And each one of us has our own individual issues, individual things, individual isms to be saved from. But we cannot, we will never experience any type of encounter or any type of, um, let alone a walk in freedom without acknowledging that we need a savior. So that is the most, the, the, it, it is a facade and we are lying to ourselves. God already knows, okay, every bit of it because he knows everything. We've established that. And, and you know, if you struggle with that, pray for greater faith to understand, to, to come to understand who God is, all right? But we've established that God knows everything. So it's just this facade if we think we're hiding it from, like by not talking about it, by not acknowledging it like it somehow doesn't exist. That's a lie of the enemy. We need a savior. We have to acknowledge that we need to be saved. That we do truly, we, we do, we can. It is absolutely at our, at our fingertips, like to become a new creation. To become a new creation is absolutely 100% possible because Jesus came and it is available for us, all right? The other caution there is, you've heard me speak about it before, is having a love-hate relationship with our misery, a love-hate relationship with our bondage. If you've been carrying it for so long that it scares the you-know-what out of you to think about what life would be like without it, it'd be like, who am I without this anxiety? Who would I be? If you've come to just repeat over and over again in yourself, well, I have anxiety. I'm an anxious person. You have to stop that, okay? Because you you have made that your identity, and that is not your identity. Um, I am this. I am that. I am this. I am that. No, you are a child of God, all right? And you have to ask yourself, am I scared to lose my old identity? Am I scared to lose my false identity, not the true identity that has been won for me on the cross? Am I scared? Does that make me uncomfortable to truly get to be a new creation, to truly discover who I am in Christ Jesus as a, as a son or as a daughter of Jesus' dad? Does that scare me? You know, we have to acknowledge those things and we have to be willing to release what has us in bondage? We have to be willing to release the lie. We have to be willing to acknowledge, I want a new thing. Like the pain, we will not ever, we will not ever change. We will not ever even invite in change. It'll never go from any more than our head. We will never make it an act of the will until we can accept that the pain of change is greater than the the pain of, hold on, the pain of staying the same has to be greater than the pain of change. The pain of staying the same has to be greater than the pain of change. Change can be scary. What's this new life in Christ going to look like? What's freedom going to look like? That can be a little scary. It can be a little, um, you know, I hope it's exciting. But at the same time, many of us, when things are different, um, it makes us a little uncomfortable because we get so used to um, the way things are that we come into agreement with this is just how it's going to be. But we have to really be ready and, and we won't want anything different until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. So if we can just remove the emotion from it and accept it for what it is, we're more likely to ask for it. We're more likely to accept it when it comes. And if we get it, we're more likely to hold on to it instead of, instead of going back into that old comfortable way that's really not comfortable, it's just known. 
But, but what this whole purpose is for us to have a, do, a new different type of knowing, for us to know the Father and to know who we are as his beloved, to know that he delights in us, right? Are you following me? So we, the caution there when it, this acknowledging that we need a Savior is that we don't continue to wear an identity that's not truly ours, not that we were designed to have, right? And I believe that once we sort of have our mind in that place and are ready for that, it gets to it, what the author talked about in chapter 5 was moving from Savior to Lord and the journey of, of Jesus being your Savior to Him becoming the Lord of your life. To me, that is the difference in the statement, being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. And here's why. You, you have this love encounter. When we encounter Jesus, when we encounter this love, the love, it's really through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Whether you know it or not. Because the Holy Spirit is that person of the Trinity that is the love relationship between the Father and the Son, right? When we have an encounter, that changes us forever. Look at all the Bible stories, all the stories of Scripture. You have a people, you have a person who is one way. They encounter Jesus. There's something different after that encounter, right? They have an encounter. Maybe even it's in the letters of, of you know, in Paul, the Paul's letters or whatever. And when they're telling about, or in the Acts of the Apostles, you know, that's still, still through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that they have this encounter, all right? And then they're different. That is this point of freedom. When we have this love encounter, that is a point of freedom. It's a point of freedom in our life, all right? At that point, we're liberated because love takes care of everything. And it is love that facilitates that encounter. It is the person of love that we meet in that encounter. And love, love is the answer to absolutely everything that isn't right in this world, in this fallen world. Love is that answer. And it is Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who, it's like he's holding our hand or it's like he comes upon us, overshadows us. That however, however you can best receive that. But that is that moment of encounter. That is that point of freedom. That is whenever he becomes our savior, right? We are saved in that moment. And we can be saved many times. We can have diff many different moments of encounter. All right? Hopefully that changes us enough. And we have enough of an experience there to, to want for that to be our normative way of life, our normative living. And it is only then that we decide through surrender to walk in the way, to walk on his path. So it's like, it's like being set free is not the same as living in freedom. Living in freedom is to walk in the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But in order to do that, we have to surrender our own self. It's like, it's like in this moment of encounter, Jesus offers us an invitation. But in this, um, on this path to freedom, it's our invitation back to him to come into our life to stay. It's our invitation back to him to be the Lord of our life. So, it's like his invitation to us and then our invitation to him. It's just this beautiful dance, if you will. It's like, it's, it's, it's like he invites us to know him and then when we invite him in to take over, if you will. It's, 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 it's all about the invitation. It's all about the invitation because he's not going to force himself in. He's not going to force himself in. All right? He's not going to come in and abide in us if he's not invited. He's just not going to do that because that's not love. It goes against the very nature of who he is. He cannot be anything that he's not. But he wants us to ask him in to be the Lord of our life. That is the difference in having a, in having a, a, a moment of freedom and being set free and then living in freedom. We surrender our way of doing things to his way of doing things. 
and it's really an act of the will. It's an act of the will, and it's a, it's, it's, it takes being very honest with ourselves that, like, where in my life am I not doing that? Where am I not living according to that? And maybe we haven't even realized it. Maybe we think, okay, I've been set free, but if you've been set free, but you don't feel free, then you're not living in freedom. And I would, I would propose that you haven't truly surrendered and you're still trying to maintain control and do things your way, ungodly self-reliance. And it's a decision. It's a daily decision. Sometimes it's a decision that we make many times a day, right? Because we find ourselves stepping back into that old self, all right? And we will always probably struggle with that, this side of heaven, because we have this inclination to sin called concupiscence. And, and Satan rules everything down here, and he's constantly feeding us darkness. He's constantly feeding us doubt. It's like, it's like either him or some of his minions that he's assigned are just constantly trying to get in your way, in your path, so you can fall over them and open yourself right back up to his coming in. All right? It just, it is what it is. All right. Remember that well-worn path back to the Father. It's that well-worn path back to the Father. Fall down seven times, stand up eight, whatever. Who's counting? You know, as long as we always stand up one more time, stand up and run back to the Father when He comes running to us, as long as we stand up and turn back towards Him, as long as we do that one more time then we fall, we're still going back home. We're still going back home, that well-worn path back to the Father. There's a couple of questions in the chapter 5 um, study guide that I want us to look at today. Um, the first one asks us, what was your first personal encounter with the Lord like? What was your first personal encounter with the Lord like? And I think, honestly, we might even have to ask ourselves if we've ever had a personal encounter with the Lord. If we've ever had a per I, I would say, you got to get, if you haven't, you got to get to a quiet place and you got to get into some of your pain and ask him to, ask him to come and ask him where he was in it. Ask him what he thinks about it. Invite him into those places. You'll have a love encounter. There's no doubt. He's not going to leave you in a place of pain because that's not who he is. I do think we have to be available because he is love. He's not going to force himself upon us, right? What was your first personal encounter with the Lord like? If you can go back into that place and see yourself there, think about maybe what you were wearing, where you were at, what the smells are like in the room. Engage your senses in that very place. You can go, your mind is so powerful that you can take yourself back there in your mind. That's the power of the mind, my friends. You can go back to that place and remember. And if your mind, when you can go there by an act of your will and going into that place, you will then, your feelings will then follow and you will be able to have that same feeling it may not be to the magnitude, but you can go back and you can have those same feelings and you can feel the Spirit of the Lord come over you again. And here's why. Because He operates in Kairos and He transcends time and space. And that's just what He does. All right? He will take you back to that place. And and it's a, it's a tool that we use in therapy sometimes. When you can go back to that place of, the, of something so positive like that, whenever the world around you appears to be falling apart, it can be a great tool in your tool belt to help you navigate darkness, to help you navigate if despair starts to come upon you or sadness or perhaps there's things going on in this world that you don't understand. You can take yourself back there to that moment of encounter where you felt good, where you felt loved, where you felt whole, where you felt peace where you felt those things, you can, you can go back there in your mind. That is the power of the mind. So we can use the mind as our own tool instead of, instead of Satan using our mind to manipulate us or to torment us. It's like we decide 
who's going to be playing in the playground of our mind, right? We decide that. We decide that. That's, that's why it's important. And when we can go back to that place where we remember that, then we'll always have that. We call that to mind. And then it becomes like, it can almost become as if it just happened instead of happened however long ago, right? And likely, I mean, there's even that possibility that you are able to have another encounter right there, all right? Because that's the goodness of God. And you know, in that moment, did you know him as the Savior? Did you know him as a Savior? Did you, acknowledging, did you acknowledge him as your Savior? And having that, having that memory will help to lead you to um, surrender and to acknowledge him as Lord is what that will do. Here's the, here's the next question to ponder. In what ways has your brokenness drawn you nearer to the Lord? In what ways has your brokenness drawn you nearer? And here it goes back to like the first thing that we talked about this morning here. We have to acknowledge that we need to be saved, which means we have to be willing if we want to have freedom in our life. And I realize that sucking it up and getting over it and all this all this stuff might have been a survival. Or like it might have been something in that moment that we needed to be able to survive, like a survival instinct. If I, if I don't acknowledge it, that it doesn't exist, okay? Those are survival instincts. But they, they, they will save you in the moment, but they're not going to help you be free, all right? And it becomes a prison. It becomes like your own personal hell. And hell is a door locked from the inside, right? So we have to acknowledge our brokenness. And that might be hard, especially if we've been conditioned or if we were at a place in our life where we just had to suck it up and move on, all right? But you have to acknowledge your brokenness. You have to acknowledge your wounds. You have to acknowledge that real stuff because it just festers and it manifests as different ways. If you live with anxiety, if you live with fear, if you live, you know, with depression, if you live with trauma, just forgetting about that and not processing it, it will fester. It will fester. I can't tell you. I, I'm just going to, it's just on my heart to share this, okay? If you have had an abortion and, and perhaps you were very, very young and you had an abortion and you live today with extreme anxiety and you're not real sure where it comes from or mood instability, if you don't know where it comes from, not having... The DNA of the child that you aborted still lives in your body, okay? That is science. I can't tell you how many people that I see in therapy, when I get into doing an extensive history of their life and going back and telling me about all the stuff, I can't tell you how often that common thread of having had an abortion or more than one abortion Usually when they're very young, in their teenage years, you know, and it's usually whenever they were they were convinced by someone else that it needed to happen or they wouldn't be able to take care of the child or, you know, it would shame the family. There's usually a great degree of stuff that goes along with that decision. I can't tell you how many times that the common thread is that they have had an abortion, that they haven't acknowledged that they just sort of dismissed. And if that's you, the Lord wants to set you free from that. There are resources available, okay? You may not even have recognized until this very moment that that could be the root cause for um, some of that anxiety, most all of that anxiety. There's a spirit of death that comes to attack whenever that happens, okay? We've come into agreement with something, and I just want you to know that the Lord wants to set you free from that. He wants to set you free from that, okay? And if you need resources, you private message me, okay? My, my Facebook is public. If you're hearing this, then, um, then you can reach me, all right? But there are resources available. But I'm just telling you that if you deal with something that you can't seem to shake, 
and I, I work for a psychiatrist, and I'm not saying that there's not a place for medication, but if medications don't even seem to take care of it completely and it's just like a Band-Aid on it, there's something deeper. There's a deeper root there that needs to be discovered, all right? And you have to go to those places of brokenness. The Lord wants to meet you there and help you walk out of that, all right? In what ways has your brokenness drawn drawn you near to the Lord? But if you don't ever acknowledge your brokenness, he can't walk with you because you're not walking, all right? You have to acknowledge it in order for him to be able to come be the mercy, the salve, the, the answer, the love, the love, all right? We have to first acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge our brokenness. All right, now we're going to talk about forgiveness. Now we're going to talk about forgiveness. One of the questions in this chapter was, about our earthly fathers, okay? What things did your father do or not do that you need to forgive him for? What things did your father do or not do that you need to forgive him for? And your dad may be a great man. He may be a great man. But if your dad is not Jesus' dad, which he's not, then he's going to fall short. So we can just get this comparison thing, push it to the side, because that that is a veil that's going to keep you from being in total freedom and, and totally being open to the love of Jesus' dad, okay? What things did your dad, did your father do or not do that you need to forgive him for? Some of you guys can fill up a notebook on this one, all right? Maybe it was your grandfather, Maybe it was your uncle. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a coach and your dad didn't know and so therefore your dad couldn't protect you. Um, and so maybe it's both of them. Or maybe your dad did know and maybe because it was his buddy and he was just like, oh, let me beat his, let me, let me go take care of this but you were never nurtured and attended to and your dad didn't know what to do with it so he just held you at a distance. I, I hear a lot of hear a lot of I hear a lot of stories, people's stories. Your story, your story will keep you bound up if you don't bring your story to light. And if you need a therapist, if you need somebody to walk, seek seek the help of of a pastor or um, a, a trusted friend or a counselor, okay, someone who who does trauma work or can refer you to someone else. Perhaps you don't walk that one alone, you know. You can reach out to me too, okay? But we have to acknowledge these things. We have to acknowledge these things. Because we see God the Father through the lens of our earthly experiences. It's just, it is what it is. And when you get some of the big stuff out of the way, then there's going to be little stuff, little stuff, little stuff. Because it's all about greater and greater degrees of freedom. Greater and greater degrees of freedom, right? Maybe your dad worked his tail off so he could provide for you. And so he was tired and didn't have time to go pitch a football in the backyard. Maybe he was an over-the-road trucker and didn't... What it, look, it doesn't matter what it was. If it... If it hurt in any way, we got to we gotta bring that to light. We have to acknowledge that. I believe this was where I felt really prompted even to maybe we need to apologize to our own children without an explanation to them, without explaining to them why we made the choices that we made. We just need to apologize. And perhaps... This is also where we're going to have to accept an apology that we will never receive. But we have to forgive. We have to forgive. You will never, ever, ever walk in freedom. You will never live in freedom if you have unforgiveness in your heart. Ever. Ever. Never. It's impossible. And maybe we have to forgive several times a day. Maybe we just have to say, Lord, I want to forgive. Show me how to forgive. Show me how to forgive. 
There was a woman one time who I heard at a talk. Her name was Mary Beth Eikhoff. I've never, I, I, maybe even, I don't even know if I've ever met her, but I'll never forget because she told her story of forgiveness and it helped me so much because she said that she pled with the Lord, God, you're going to have to let me see them through your eyes because I can't look at them through mine. I have to see them through your eyes because I can't look at them through mine. That's a surrender. That's a prayer of surrender. But it also shows like, I know I need to forgive and I want to forgive, but I'm having trouble forgiving. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit has to help you there. You cannot do it on your own. We cannot do all this stuff on our own, y'all. We just can't. We were never designed to be able to do this on our own. Dependence upon God. Dependence upon God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in you will help you to forgive. Actually, you're just sort of along for the ride. They're the ones that do the forgiving. It's just our will. Is our will open? Our free will to freely walk like Jesus did. Forgive forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. He said that from the cross. He said that from the cross. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And when you come to forgiveness... When you come to forgiveness, we, we really deserve to make a mental note of what new freedoms does forgiveness bring you into. Acknowledge the freedom that you feel once you make this act of forgiveness. It's going to help the equation make sense for you. It's going to help it make sense. We have to forgive. We have to forgive. We won't be forgiven if we don't forgive. I don't care if you're saved or not. That's what the scripture says. We have to forgive. If we want to be forgiven, if we want to be forgiven our sins and our transgressions, we have to forgive. We can't pick and choose what we want to believe out of this book. You can't pick and choose what you want to believe. And, and I'm telling you, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to, 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 to accept it, to embrace it, to walk in it, to live it. We can't do that on our own. We, can't, we, are, we are too human. We're too human. <laughs> We're too human to do it on our own. We're too human. We need heaven's help. Heaven help us. Look, we can even pray that prayer and with, with a sincere and contrite heart. Heaven help us. I think that's good. I think we should just end today with forgiveness and repenting. Repentance. Repentance is big. Repentance is asking for forgiveness from our sins. Forgiving ourselves. Maybe the person you need to forgive is yourself. You know? Shoot. There's a whole degree in freedom of forgiving yourself. Amazing words from, from 12 Step. That's not who I am today. That's not who I am today. That's not who I am today. Because Satan, in the form of other people, will remind you of every sin, everything you've done wrong, every all this stuff that you've given to the Lord a hundred times, and then here's going to come somebody, usually a family member, usually the people that are claimed to love you the most, that remind you of what you did. And if you can acknowledge, that's not who I am today. That's not who I am today. That's not who I am today. Because you walk in a new freedom, because you've given your life to Christ, because you've asked him to show you the way, that's not who you are today. No matter what you've done, that's not who you are today. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're living out your baptismal call. You're living out that freedom that comes from being a new creation. That's not who you are today. Repent and move on. Repent and move on because we have to learn how to live differently. We're, we got to get through this stuff so we can learn how to live a life in Christ. We have to learn how to live as a daughter and a son because it is a foreign concept to most of us, but he wants to show us. He wants to show us the way. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. And we got a decision to make. We got a decision to make. Decide. The root word there is side. 
like genocide, homicide, pesticide, to kill off all other options. We have to decide if we want to live in freedom. If we want to live in freedom, there are no other options. Decide. Do I want to live in freedom? To eliminate all other options. Being set free is not the same thing as living in freedom. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's exciting. Get your tissue and dive in. I mean, it's okay. Cry. He collects all your tears in heaven. He collects all your tears. He collects all your tears. And on the other side of pain is freedom. On the other, You have to walk through it. He's walking beside you. It's his invitation. It's like, it's like, We've, we, he, he's invited us and now we're inviting him to walk with us, to show us the path to freedom. Show us your way. Show us your way, Jesus. Show us your way. Take us home to your dad. Take us home to your dad. We surrender and we give it all to you because all glory and honor is yours. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. <laughs> Thank you for going into the realm of the dead and getting Adam and everybody else and bringing them all back, bringing them all back home. Some good stuff, y'all. Some good stuff. All right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about God the Father. And then we're going to move on to chapter 7 the next day. Chapter 8 the next day. We are going to talk. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to press back into chapter 6 and 7 a little bit more. And then we're going to move on to chapter 8. And we'll, we'll probably spend two days in each chapter. Because because this needs to set in with us. We don't need to spend too much time because he's going to continue to reveal things to us as long as our hearts are open. You guys have an amazing Wednesday. God bless you. God bless you. Remember, Jesus walks with you. Goodbye.